Hi everybody, this is Josh Weidman here with TCS Investments. Today we're talking about how to learn to invest in real estate the easy way. I'm here with our project manager and uh, back-end developer, um, Elise Elise Hi. Choi. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us for today. And um, but before we really jump into some of the nitty gritty, I wanted to get started by kind of explaining the title today a little bit. Um, you know, a, a lot of times when you've got in real estate investors or people that are just looking to get in, investing in real estate, um, you know, there's a lot of attraction there. There's, it's all over TV. You see a lot of the flip this house type shows and, um, you know, it becomes a, a pretty attractive thing. But a lot of times there's some barriers of entry that make becoming a full-time investor or even, you know, investing on a part-time basis in addition to your full-time job, it makes it kind of difficult. You know, you got to find the deals, yep. right? Um, you you got to go out and you got to be able to, uh, if you're doing renovations on these places, you got to have the contractors, you got to manage them. Um, you know, I've done several hundred projects um, throughout my, my tenure here and with, uh, you know, in, in my own flips. And I'll tell you what, some of the most difficult things about a real estate devel um, development or construction project is making sure that the contractors are on time. They're showing up for work. You know, they're not splitting time between another project. Totally. Um, making sure that they're doing quality work and being able to stop it soon enough if you realize that it's not what you want. Um, but beyond that, you know, once you've got that finished product, you still have to lease the place out. You still have to deal with tenants and managing them and, and making sure they're paying rent on time and then dealing with maintenance and, you know, things like that. So today, the whole goal for today is basically to show you how that you can invest in real estate the easy way. And that is without having to scour the countryside trying to find deals, without having to ever talk to a contractor, let alone manage a project and, and um, you know, hold, hold a contractor's hand through the job how you can get those benefits of investing in real estate without ever having to try to go find a tenant, never having to worry about screening them, never having to worry about knocking on the door and getting 4 a.m. calls about a leaky toilet, you know, uh, and not have to manage the place once it's done so that you get all of the benefits like the tax incentives, um, you know, the de depreciation on the property, the appreciation and growth in the cash flow that comes with a good real estate investment without ever having to get your hands dirty. Yeah, to be honest, that's the exact reason or reasons why I haven't jumped in, uh, in sure. investing. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to, but all that stuff kind of freaks me out. So yeah, and and you know what, it can be confusing if you really don't know what to what to get into. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump forward here in our in our presentation, and um, what I really would like to do here is um, first kind of. Talk about a couple things. The first is that um, I want to talk about our foundational elements. There's mm -hmm. three foundational elements that build any successful investment. And then I want to backtrack and, and kind of talk about how we came up with this model. All right. So the first okay. thing is that um, or the three foundational elements that we found successful and consistent in every one of our um, investor portfolios that continually makes money in the market. It's based on the location, the renovations, or mm -hmm. the condition of the property. And then the calculations on how they evaluate the property, how these, um, you know, how we evaluate the cash flow and the value of the property when when we're getting into an investment. Now, I've been investing since um, November of 2006, so I've been doing this coming on, uh, you know, coming on 12 years. And during that time, I've been involved in over a thousand transactions. I started as a wholesaler, um, tried to flip three properties. I, actually, if, if we for fair, from from being honest, you know, I got started and I bought three properties with two friends of mine. We went in, we bought them all in subprime markets, and uh, you know, it was right before the subprime crash, but nobody knew it at the time. Yeah. So um, we bought these properties in December, January, and February of 2006, and then 2007. And as we're working on them, the subprime market just disappears. Right. And so you know, we're. 90% done with one, 70% with the other, and you know, a month in on another project, and all of a sudden, um, you know, we're kind of concerned that our buyers are drying up. And at the, at the end of the day, um, lost some money on the project. It mm -hmm. wasn't a, a luckily we bought it good numbers, but um, you know, it, it was an eye opener. Hey, real estate, you know, it's it's not a a sure thing, especially if it, you don't know what you're doing. And so um, at that same time. 
it's pretty random. I got a, I had a construction company years ago and one of my salesmen uh, called me up and he says, Hey, Josh, um, you didn't know this, but I'm a cocaine addict. And he's like, I just oh. got out of rehab. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't heard from you for yeah. a while. Nice to hear it. Right. Um, you know, at the, at the time it was really shocking, you know, and, and I started talking to him. He said, look, I just got out of rehab. Haven't paid my mortgage in six months. I, I heard you're buying, um, buying properties. And so, you know, I wanted to reach out to you and see if you'd make me an offer in the house. Sure. So, you know, I went out to see the property. It was um, the typical ugliest house on a gray block, um, you know, great location, really nice uh, bones to the property, but mm -hmm. it was a mess. So um, we, we talked about some numbers at the end of the day, made an offer, he accepted, put the place under contract. And I can remember walking out of the house thinking to myself, holy mackerel, I just lost three, you know, money on three houses. Yeah. What the heck am I going to do with this thing, you know? And so... At that point, um, I started doing a little research and I stumble on this this uh, concept called wholesaling. And if you're not familiar, essentially what wholesaling is, is that we go out and um, would, would find really discounted deals and we put them under contract. And, you know, let's say that the market, the market rate for a cash, you know, investor sale is $50,000 for these, this area. We put it under contract for twenty five or 30000 and then sell the contract to an investor for 40000 they're still getting a great deal and we end up, you know, making 10,000. Yeah. Exactly. And so build a model or a business around that. It, on that first deal, I ended up making $30,000 and I'm going, this is way better than, <laughs> than what I was doing, you know, flipping houses, yeah. losing money. And so anyway, long story short, ended up um, building a business around that model. We're doing 10 or 12 transactions on a monthly basis, making great money. And then all of a sudden, 2010 shows up. And the unique thing about 2010 and right around that area, a lot of the areas of the country, that was the bottom of the market. And so we were running into a lot of people that wanted to sell their homes, but the problem was there was no equity. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't get a deep enough discount because prices had gone down and people had stripped all the equity out of their properties. So at that point, my business partner and I looked at each other and we said, you know, we're making 2,500 on the transaction as opposed to 25,000, you know, maybe two years earlier we got to change our business model. And that's when we decided we're going to get into property management. It seemed like a good, you know, ancillary business to flipping or rentals or, you know, what was happening. And so we built this business from uh, our own for units up to 630 units from 2010 to 2015. Wow. Um, and it was, the name of the company was Atlas Property Management. We end up selling that to TCS Management that, uh, you know, we end up reconnecting couple years later here to, to build the um, TCS investments. But along the way, it, it's kind of interesting. I never heard of turnkey investing before. Um, I never even heard of the concept of, uh, you know, a company that puts all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. But um, our management company was doing well. And this Israeli airline pilot found our website, ends up at our office, and he says, sell me some properties, you know, and starts telling me about he, how he had been investing in Florida for years. And, and he was doing really well there, but the market had recovered uh -huh. and he was ready to move into another market. And so, you know, he, I sent him a few properties. He bought one, we renovated, rented it out. And then he did it over and over and over again. And over a course of six, eight months, he probably bought 20 properties, started That's bringing his awesome. friends and family in and you know, we had, had the business. Yeah. So, um, but that's, that's kind of, um, it, along the way with this airline pilot, one thing that really, um, kind of blew me away because I wasn't really familiar on, with investors buying in a market where in, that they didn't live in. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me to get a grasp on what he wanted. And so I sent him a ton of different types of properties and he bought a ton of different types of properties. Some of them were such home runs that, you know, he got three or four times his investment just a few years later. Others did not work out so well. And so I, one day we, um, I sold him one of the, one property that really was just not, uh, it didn't work out well. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was like every, anything that could go wrong <laughs> did go wrong on the transaction. So, uh, you know, I, I'm talking to him one day, I said, look, I'm really sorry about this. And he, he was understanding he was making money on, on a good number of his properties. He said, look, I get it. You know, so this is kind of comes with a business. But I was, it, it really bothered me. So I ended up going back to, um, to our records. I realized I've got like 4,000 leases here throughout the course of our management. I've got a bunch of, uh, I've got access to a bunch of different um, types of owners 
and a lot of different uh, you know levels of success. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking at what was common across the board with some of these successful owners, and what it came down to, uh, you know, every one of them, they were very specific on the location of their investments. Okay. All of them had properties that had certain characteristics on the, either the renovation or the um, the quality of the product when they turned it over to us. And then they all seemed to get the same type of calculations on where they bought the houses, what kind of rent rates they were getting, what, what their total investment was on these properties. And so at the end of the day, this became the foundation of our business model. And, it, and it's changed slightly over the years, but these three foundational elements, if you're gonna invest in a in a rental or a cash flow property, you've got to have these three elements, you know, addressed as part of your investment. Cool. So you talk about location, um, but you know, let's say let's talk about a neighborhood, let's say like Cobb's Creek. Right. Um, there's tons of properties within Cobb's Creek. How do you know which one is going to be the money maker? Well, and when I say location, I'm talking about neighborhoods because. You know, especially in a city, you know, a city environment, an area like Philadelphia, you can have within a five or ten block, you know, um, variance. You, you could have a property that's worth a hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and five or ten blocks away, you can have something that's worth, you know, close to a million. And so, what we do is we target specific areas that in, in specific neighborhoods, even within zip codes, that we know have a, um, a successful history. We've had a successful history of managing these properties, finding successful tenants that pay their rent on time, stay for a long time, and ultimately are, um, you know, our benefit. But we also look at areas uh, or, or target areas that have at least 50% owner occupancy. Usually they're more like 60 to 75%. Okay. This allows our clients to end up selling their properties when it's time to sell and not have to sell to another investor on a cash flow, but more so sell to a, a um, an end buyer who can, you know, they're going to pay a little bit more. They're going to have an emotional attachment mm -hmm. to the property and, and, you know, be attracted to that. But we also, you know, we're looking in areas that have high rent to values and, and lower than average crime rates. And really, that's that's the first place, place to dive into. So let's let's cool. take a look at some of the locations here. So we've got two types of locations where we invest. One is our traditional rental model. All right. So these are those areas where we have, you know, 60, 65, 70% owner occupancy rates. Typically these are houses that are going to have an after repair value of about 115,000 up to $175,000. They're, okay. they're areas where you have renovated properties selling uh, to, you know, first time home buyers, um, or you know the lower end of the housing market, but there we're looking at pr um, neighborhoods and properties in neighborhoods where you've got anywhere from three to five retail rehab sales mm -hmm. within a quarter mile radius from the house. Um, these are properties that are targeted for their cash flow, and we'll get into this in just a minute, like what the areas are and what are some of the characteristics. But the the investment play here is that in the traditional rental model is cash flow. You know, it's that monthly check. Mm -hmm. Whereas with our developing markets, something really interesting about Philadelphia, um, it's a really old city. I mean, we have homes here that were built in the late 1600s, That's 1700s. so crazy to think about. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Um, you know so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's an old city. There are neighborhoods right. that were built in the 1880s that are still sitting there and like the whole neighborhood was built at the same time. So what ends up happening is that the city goes through cycles and there'll be neighborhoods that are neglected and some of them are neglected like since world war ii you know we're, we're talking about 80 years yeah. of um not neglect but lack of development and upkeep and so what ends up happening is whether it's because of external forces a, a neighborhood next to it developing mm -hmm. or you know maybe there is new development um uh, released in you know right around the area Wh whatever triggers it these are neighborhoods that go through gentrification. They're in the midst of it. Right. And so we target these neighborhoods because what we've seen, I've, I've gone through this six or seven times myself where I've seen the beginning through the whole maturation process. Through gentrification, you end up starting with a neighborhood that is not nice. And the first 
uh, first phase of change is that you see artists start moving in there and it's, they always know, I know <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you know, while I think it, it, it's a cool thing and if you want to speculate, you know, you can start buying then yeah. we don't do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, the artists, they might be there for a, a year. They might be there for 20 years. You know, we can't see that. But once you, the artists start moving and now you get students start moving into the area and after they, they start getting a foothold. Now you have young professionals that start moving in. Once you have the young professionals are, are starting to change, now you've got half the block renovated properties. Then the families start coming. It becomes a, a much more mature, safe, nice place. And you also see, you know, in, in this phase, a lot of uh, small businesses, you have bars and restaurants mm -hmm. moving into the area, new retail and things like that. But once you get to the family phase, there's no money to be made. You know, the, the neighborhood is mature. It's very hard to find deals there. And, you know, if you're buying for cash flow, it's really difficult. Got it. So what we do is we we'll, we try to target these neighborhoods in between the student and the young professional phase. And so by doing that, we can catch the market in the midst of transition. These are neighborhoods where it's not speculation. We're not hoping that the market goes up. We're looking at this and saying, the market's already changing. Let's get in during the transition. So in a very short period of time, we can double or triple our money. And, and we're talking about a five to 10 year period where the this massive uh, appreciation happens. So that is the developing market. That's in our correct. developing market. Correct. correct. And you said how how long does it take? Six years. You five, said? We're looking at five to ten years. Five now, to ten years. We, we the, the interesting thing is we actually have a case study based on the market crash of two thousand eight. It was a, a neighborhood in Philly that started going through gentrification, mm -hmm. and then in two thousand eight, it just crashed, just like the rest of the market. It just froze. Yeah. But if you fast forward ten years. It's back up. Oh my goodness. I, I, like, I can remember running a lead on a house. The, the area in Philly is uh, Point Breeze. In 2016 and 2017, it had two zip codes that were um, appreciating uh, in, in the top 10 in the entire country. I mean, it was one of the fastest growing, changing neighborhoods. But what, what you see here is I, I can remember running a lead in, um, it was like 19th and, uh, and Manton Street. Now, if you're not from the area or you're not from Philly, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But right now, it is a very nice neighborhood. Houses are selling in the four to five hundred thousand dollar range. But I can remember looking at a renovated house that the, this um, this young woman bought right before the crash for one hundred and twenty five thousand, and she just wanted me to take over her mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. She's she's like, you can have the house, take over my mortgage payments, and at the time, I'm I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well. Stupid. Now it's worth four hundred yeah, grand, fast, right? Fast you forward, know? Yeah. yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty, yeah. but we we try to project into the future and be able to see. Okay, on a worst case scenario, you're going to get great returns in ten years. On a best case, you're looking at two x or three three x your money within the next five years. Cool. All right. Cool. So that's our our. Um, those are the two kind of locations. We're basing these. We're we're looking in areas where we have stability and we can see the trends that moving in an upward direction. All right. So that traditional rental area, um, the, the neighborhoods that we target here are based in two general areas of the city. We've got the northwestern quadrant of the city and we've got the western quadrant of the city. So in West Philly, there's a bunch of neighborhoods. In, in yeah, West Philly, it's a really interesting area because you've got a lot of stuff going on there. You have University of Pennsylvania, you have Drexel University. And, and University uh, Sciences. But exactly. Yeah. University of Sciences. And uh, what's really interesting about University City is that, um, I don't know, 35, 40 years ago, it wasn't so nice. But there was a, uh, a student that was assaulted right off of campus, like a block from campus in a parking garage. And um, University of Pennsylvania, they made some immediate and drastic changes. And the first thing that they did is they brought in their own police force. So now there was two police forces mm -hmm. working in the same area. But they, what they also did, and I think this is brilliant, they set up a quadrant just left of, uh, or just to the west of, um, of the university, where they said, if you are a faculty and staff member, if you move into this quadrant and buy a house, we'll give you 110% financing on the acquisition. Oh, yeah. So you had all of these faculty members and staff members that moved into this area. It's called Spruce Hill, and it overnight changed. It's now you know these houses were, are like. Victorians built in the yeah, 1800s. They're beautiful. They're beautiful and they're restored and it's just yeah. a gorgeous area. At about the same time, 
Drexel had something similar going on. So they added their own police force. And now you've got three police forces going, uh, you know, protecting the students, things like that. But Drexel's kind of cool for a totally different reason. They are on a trimester system. So that means that for two semesters a year, or I'm sorry, two trimesters a year, the students go to class, but then on the third, they're required to do an internship or a co-op. And so, you, I mean, Drexel is a pretty um, technical university. Mm -hmm. And so it's attracted all of these small and medium sized technically based businesses right to West Philadelphia. And so, uh, you know, there's other student rental areas in the city, but they're a lot more time sensitive. Like if you miss the student rental market, you're not getting students for a year. Right. Whereas in West Philadelphia, that's not true at all. You've got the opportunity to tap the student population or you can, you know, you can rent to somebody that just wants to live in the area. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really good, um, good option. But uh, what we really like West Philly, um, we get really, uh, we've had some really great um, value growth there. Very excellent, about 25% growth in the rental rates right now. And um, bottom line here is that with these properties, you'd be looking at a an investment of somewhere between ninety and one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars for a property that's worth anywhere from one hundred and fifteen to one hundred and seventy five thousand. Um, that is an all in investment. When I say the ninety to one fifteen ish, okay. um, that includes the acquisition, the construction, the closing costs, all that stuff. And from that, you end up seeing uh, about an eight to ten percent cap rate. Um, let's take a look at some of these neighborhoods. So, all right, if this is Philadelphia up in our right uh, top right hand corner, this is uh, Philadelphia proper, center like city. the center city, yeah. right? This is what most people see when um, or think of when they are thinking about Philadelphia. You've got, you know, the Ben Franklin Museum. You've got, um, you know, Comcast. There we go. Yeah, our, our nation's capital, yeah. our old nation's capital, right? There's all kinds of all kinds of stuff in Center City here, but we don't invest here because, frankly, the the um, the area is mature. There's not a lot of upside here, and the cash flow doesn't make sense because of the price points. But this is our developing market um, region right here in West Philadelphia. We've got King Sessing on the southern end. This is one of the fastest appreciating. Uh, neighborhoods in Philadelphia right now, which is uh, pretty amazing. And then you've got Cobbs Creek. Cobbs Creek is one area that we love. The property values are really strong here. There's a very high owner occupancy rate. And more and more, there's a lot more developers coming in to retail these type of properties. And so it's, um, you know, it, it, this is just kind of blown up here, but Cobbs Creek is uh, great. Yeah, I was driving by not too long ago, and it's crazy to see all these different types of developments going up I in know. West Philly. I know, and it's they're, insane. I mean, at fifty, um, at fifty second, and I'm sorry, fifty ninth, between fifty ninth and sixtieth Street on Market Street, uh -huh. there's a huge development that that just started, and it is pushing property values like crazy. Wow. I mean, yeah, the the um, their entry level homes starting at two hundred twenty thousand, which is awesome because I mean, three years ago. The market was capped at about 125,000 yeah. in this area. It's just really growing. Um, just north of market, so Cobbs Creek is is right here between. Uh, if you see this yellow line here, this is Baltimore Avenue, and we have Market Street on the top here. So this is Cobbs Creek. North of market here, you've got, um, excuse me, you've got Carroll Park and Haddington. These are two neighborhoods where we get great properties. The price points are a little bit lower, but the the, um, the rental rates are still high. So it's a really nice uh, nice price point there. Then we've got Winfield up here and Overbrook. These areas are typically a little bit more expensive. They're in the little higher end, um, but the rents follow. Uh, so, you know, the cash flow yeah. is, is still good. St. Joe's is right by there, right? The That's exactly right, yeah. exactly. The uh, Winfield here, Number five on the top mm -hmm. is right near St. Joseph's University. Um, it's right inside the city limits. And the the property values here are closer to the two hundred thousand range, but as I said, the rents follow, so the cash flow works out. We don't get as many deals in in Overbrook and Winfield mm -hmm. because of the higher price point. There's a lot more owner occupancy there, but we do you know we do get properties there from time to time. And then the other region that we target is in the northwestern section of the city up here. Um, that, we're looking at um, Logan and, uh, excuse me, Logan and Ogons and Fern Rock right in here. 
Um, this is an area that we've just recently added to our, our focus and our, our target area list because these, these property values are going up significantly. We can get really great discounts. The houses are bigger, which is attracting um, more and better tenants. Yeah. And the it's pushing rents up. So, you know, in, in um, the Logan area, we love four bedrooms. Four bedroom properties yeah. are really in demand. So we get a lot of those in Logan. Olney, West Oak Lane and East Oak Lane here are three other neighborhoods right in the same area. They're really taking off in values. We, there are a lot of developers in West and East Oak Lane and even into Olney that are producing these really, really blown out entry level properties. Um, and so it's really pushing the, um, the after repair values. Okay. Cool stuff. Um, so for our developing markets, we have three, that's it. Just three neighborhoods. Now, these areas are in the midst of gentrification as we speak. They're neighborhoods that, um, you know, it's not if they're going to be the, a really nice mature area, it's just when. Okay. And so the idea with these three neighborhoods, again, the, the investment play is a little bit different. In these areas, you're going to see cap rates of 6 to 8%. Um, you're going to get more equity in the properties when they're uh, through mm -hmm. the renovation process. And then once you, the um, rehab is finished and they're rented, what you end up with is a lot of young professionals buying houses. But they're not ready necessarily right when they graduate from college. And so we get these young professionals that have six-figure incomes. They have all intentions and, you know, uh, of buying a house one day. It's just not right now. Mm -hmm. So they pay their bills on time. They have good credit. Um, they're, they take fairly good care of the property, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, it becomes a higher quality or an A-class tenant in a property that might be a B minus C plus today, but will very shortly be that A plus. Uh, and again, the, the, the play here is a two or three time return of investment, um, you know, within five to 10 years. I have a question. So yeah, please. Going off of traditional and, and developing markets, yeah. is it just what the investor prefers or would you recommend one over the other? Yeah, so Elise is, uh, is leading the conversation a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to jump in. No, no, it's a good question. It's a good question. So, I mean, I, I usually get this, get to this at the end of, okay. of the presentation, but now's as bad a good time as any. So this is the thing that I've realized over the years is that every investor has their own needs. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have a very similar income, a very similar job, very, you might live in the same location, but your family is gonna be different than your neighbors. You know, even though on paper you might look like, you know, you both have three kids, you both, yeah. you know <laughs> what I mean? You've both been married for 20 years, whatever it is. The, the idea here though, is that you're, we try to build a relationship with our clients to get an idea of what they're trying to accomplish with the investment. Elise, you can't see her, but she's 27. You know, your investment goals are going to be different from somebody in, in their mid fifties or in their sixties yeah, that, um, you know, you've got time on your hands. You can, uh, you can afford to say, you know what? I don't really need the money on a monthly basis. I'm, I'm just going to pay down my mortgage on this thing and let the investment develop like on an, on a, um, you know, a developing markets type neighborhood you get in today and you get a little cash flow. If you wait 20 years, you know, we're not talking about two and three times. We're talking about cash flow from these things that has caught up because the market as it matures, the rents go up as well. Mm -hmm. So you got a really great cash flow property that's worth a half a million dollars that you have 150,000 in. I mean, that's a pretty good situation. Yeah. Whereas if we've got somebody that their goal is cash flow, it's going to be a different type of neighborhood. You know, we're looking more at maximizing the monthly, um, monthly income as opposed to maximizing the exit of at the property. Now, of course, we don't want to put anybody in the ghetto. We don't want to put mm -hmm. anybody in a situation where, you know, even if the tenant, it, like <laughs> the tenant can't pay because they don't make any money, you know, yeah. we're in good neighborhoods across the board, but the type of investment that we recommend to each investor is going to depend on, on their needs and wants. Cool. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so our, our developing markets neighborhoods, there's three of them here and you can see they're not clustered together. These are pockets that are in the midst of the development. We, I mentioned Point Breeze earlier about a, um, you know, a, a neighborhood that's really going through uh, gentrification here. We've, we used to invest here. This used to be one of our de developing markets, but what happened was 
We went from buying houses at forty thousand to begging for shells at one hundred and ten thousand in you know in the course of a year, right? And so now, Point Breeze, it makes sense to flip houses there. Doesn't make sense to buy and hold because you end up upside down in the cash flow. So we moved to Grays Ferry, which is in the midst of the same type of gentrification. It's just not as far along in the development. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Grace Ferry, you can still get properties that are, um, you know, at a discount. There's still going to cash flow, and there's still going to be, you know, the, the two and three times your investment. The next area is Brewery Town. Now, this is a neighborhood that, when when, uh, well, a developer friend of mine told me about this area. First time I drove through the neighborhood, I thought he was pulling my leg. I thought it was a joke. I mean, it was a mess. It looked like um, a mouthful of broken teeth. Like all the houses were half fallen down or boarded up. It was terrible. So I watched it for a year. And, you know, you had uh, an area where you might have one house on the block under renovation mm -hmm. with no nothing completed to a year later having two or three houses on the on the block under renovation and one house done. The next year, there was one house on the block that wasn't renovated. And that has slowly been pushing out and pushing out and pushing out. I had a, um, a house that I bought in um, October of 2016. Uh -huh. I bought it probably for more than I should have paid. I paid 45000 for it. A year later, I got an unsolicited offer. Didn't renovate it. Just bought just bought it and boarded it up. It, yeah. Got an unsolicited offer for 90000 wow. on the same property. So, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that... You know, it's it's a great area. Brewery Town is blowing up. There's five or ten renovations on every block. It is just uh, exploding. Yeah, so. I have a couple of friends and friends of friends who are are buying a Brewery Town right now. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I know, I know. Up and coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the next area is um, is Port Richmond. So, um, Kensington here used to be the drug capital of the East Coast. We used to be huh. the, actually the heroin <laughs> capital of the East Coast. I did not know that. Yeah, until recently, that was the case. And I'm talking, you know, 20, 30 years it's been going on. Wow. What happened was you had this little tiny neighborhood called Fishtown here that was percolating. And when I say percolating, Fishtown was called like the up and coming neighborhood when I first got into real estate. And it had been the up and coming neighborhood for like 20 years before that. So for the last 30 years, people have been talking about how awesome Fishtown is and how great it is. And but nothing's really happened on price point. Three years ago, my uh, my neighbor was telling me about a house he just bought, a rental property. He bought it for $85,000 in Fishtown, rented it out, he was so happy with the tenants, everything was great. So six months later, he decided he's gonna buy another one. He goes back to Fishtown again to find a, another house, and he's looking at houses that are very comparable to the one he bought six months prior, 185,000. It jumped. It, it jumped, and what happened was you had the perfect storm all come together. They built a casino in the area. They built a brewery. They developed a lot of older buildings and they built a ton of new construction. And so all of this came together at the right time. And now the demand was just through the roof. And the area, it is amazing. There's all kinds of bars and entertainment and Yeah, I was gonna shopping. say really good and, restaurants are. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Well, as that development occurred, now we've got demand to live in Fishtown. But nobody wants to pay eight hundred or nine hundred thousand for a new, you know, a new construction row yeah. home, and so it started pushing into Old Kensington and Kensington, and now into Port Richmond, and so Port Richmond. I mean, I sold a property to a guy a year ago for fifty five thousand, and it's, it's in our financial analysis. We'll talk about it. But when we, um, when I sold him the property, there was a, a warehouse across the street that was for sale. A week after we closed, they announced that a developer bought the con the uh, I'm sorry the uh, warehouse, warehouse and they were building a hundred new construction homes what? in that lot. The the price jumped thirty thousand dollars just with that announcement. Yeah, and so you know that's that's the kind of thing that's happening in these areas that, that you know there were there were plenty of comps around the house beforehand, but now. You've got new construction right there. You've got a renovated house across the street. You've got three other rehabs on the block. It just, it changes the neighborhood. And that's the, it, it's kind of exciting. Uh, you kind of have to it's very know exciting. the city, but yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, that's our developing markets. Now, I get a lot of questions about where do we find our, our properties? Cause you know, look, if I go on the MLS and I pull off five houses and send them to you, 
you might as well call a real estate agent, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, and and there's nothing wrong with that. Retail prices. Exactly, you're probably gonna be paying retail, even if you're getting a really good deal. And with the market the way it is right now, there's a really big demand for good houses. And so, you know, th there's often not a ton on the MLS. What we do is we have a network of wholesalers, uh, about 150 to 200, that we are constantly in contact with, and they send us deals all the time. Uh, in addition to that, we've got neighborhood contacts. These are just people that live in areas and they're like, hey, my aunt needs to sell her house. And we build relationship with, uh, relationships with these people throughout the year. And they, or excuse me, out the year. <laughs> throughout the years, excuse me. Plural, right. yeah. Um, and bottom line is, you know, at the end of the day, they, they trust us because they know we perform. Um, we also do a lot of direct mail marketing directly to sellers. These are you know, people that have a, a high potential to sell, uh, to be motivated to sell. We try to reach out to them and we do the same thing with outbound calling. Um, we've got relationships with local banks to, um, you know, and they, they sell us their REOs all the time. And we have a lot of people that contact us through, you know, that are going through foreclosure or, you know, sometimes we'll even get contacted by the bank while they're in the foreclosure process to see if we're interested in the property or if we can go directly to the, the seller and get this thing out of court. So, you know, it, it's, um, it's really a conglomeration of searching and searching and searching for the right deals. And right now we're looking at about 150 properties before we find one that fits our investment model. So it's, I mean, we're really selective. Elisa's sitting here nodding her head. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's all, all right. cool stuff. Well, so, the, so the investor wouldn't be paying retail prices for this, right? It's, it, it'll, well, so, it'll be at a discounted okay, price? So, yeah. So the interesting thing about Philadelphia is that, especially in the markets that we're targeting, you have really two types of properties that sell. You have that unimproved property, as is cash sales. Mm -hmm. And then you have retail sales that are usually within mortgage and, you know, they're the highest price that the, the buyer can get or the seller can get, right? So what we do is we end up getting discounts on, on properties, significant discounts on properties. So people are paying, uh, they're looking at paying the cash price of the property or below what you would pay if you were working with an agent or, or something like that. Cool. Um, but I mean, at the, at the end of the day, the focus here is to get a, a property that is going to function properly, is going to be in a great location and, and is going to, you know, produce, it's yeah. going to produce an income. And the other benefit of having an off market deal is that, you know, you're not fighting people for it. Exactly. If it's on the MLS, everyone knows about it. And, you know, right. And a lot of times these, these discounted properties get bid up on the MLS, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 20, $30,000 above asking price. So, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, all right. So at least the, uh, the next foundational element here is the, the renovation. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, I have, I've gone through a lot of different models over the years with, um, with our finishes. And it, at the beginning, my goal here was to make this as damage proof as possible. We used all the same colors, uh, like our paint colors were all the same colors, ceiling, trim, doors, you know, walls, everything. Mm -hmm. That's changed over the years. I used to use a much cheaper cabinet. It's changed over the years. I used to use white appliances. Now we use stainless steel and there's reasons for all of that, but foundationally and, and like fundamentally, the first thing that we try to do with all of our renovations is to make sure that everything works properly. You see, I had this, um, property management client years ago. He was a, um, he was a plumber and he and two partners, they had a handful of, of investment properties in South Philadelphia. And these things were in fine condition, but they weren't nice looking like they had 30 year old you know, orange carpet, <laughs> um, you know, the, the cabinets were the original cabinets, mm -hmm. but he would have tenants that would move in and they would stay forever. And we never heard from them. They would just mail a rent check in. And so one day I took him out to lunch. I was like, look, Mike, what are you, what are you doing here? Like, how, how are you doing this? What's yeah, going on? How are they staying? Exactly. Why are they staying? He said, look, when you show my houses, everybody that walks through there knows exactly what they're, what they're going to get. He said, if they're comfortable with the way it looks, I guarantee that the toilet's going to flush. The heat's going to come on in the wintertime. The roof's not going to leak and the windows are going to work and everybody's going to be happy. You turn the light on, the ceiling fan comes on. The idea behind it is that ultimately what tenants really want is they want a place that they can go and live. They can be proud of and bring their friends to. 
But more importantly, they just wanted to work. Like we all have stuff going on in our daily day to day, right? Like, yeah. you know, you, we got significant others to worry about. Maybe you have kids to worry about. You have your ki- your job. You've got your home life. You, you've got your, you know, hobbies and free time and all that kind of stuff. And when the toilet doesn't flush, it's a problem. It, yeah. You know, every time that the, it rains, if you have a leak in the bedroom, that's a, a problem. Yeah. Exactly. You, you know, so our number one goal is to make sure everything works properly. And because of the age of these properties and the condition when we get them, oftentimes that, remain, that means remodeling everything. We put on a new roof, new windows, heating system, plumbing, um, electrical system, all the way from the line coming in the house, mm-hmm. all the way throughout the property. Once we know that it's mechanically and, and you know functionally sound, now we're going to go into the cosmetic repairs. And this has two functions also. We're, you, we're selecting items that are going to wear well. So in none of our apartments or houses will you ever see carpet. The reason for that? Because it wears out really fast. And yeah. it looks great when you put it in. But after, you know, one tenant, it looks like crap. you got to pull it out. Yep. Stains and who knows what. Yeah. Well, right. Exactly. We use a luxury vinyl plank flooring in all of our units. It looks great. It Is wears really well. Is that the one really in the well. pictures? Exactly. Right it's yeah. the one in the pictures. You can see it in the bedrooms at the top here and in the living room. It just looks fantastic. And guess what? If you walk around, if, if you have a three-year-old that walks around the house spilling a sippy cup <laughs> full of juice, you know, wipe it up. It's, it's not a big deal. Second thing we do is we use a tricolor paint, uh, white on the ceilings, semi-gloss on the, on the doors and trim, mm-hmm. and then gray on the walls. Now, we use the exact same manufacturer, exact same line of paint. We get it mixed at the same, um, uh, the same supply house, and it's the same color in every house. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but if you have ever tried to match up two colors that are almost right, it doesn't look right. Yeah. What this allows us to do is instead of having to paint an entire house when a tenant leaves, we paint a wall. Or we paint or we're able to spot treat areas right. where there's kids' fingerprints or dirt or whatever on those walls, instead of spending twenty five hundred dollars to paint the place every time you lose a tenant, do it, you know, spot treat it, paint a little bit of the area, and now we can turn these properties over in three days with you know, at a cost less than what you would have to pay or like what let the security deposit is on the place. Right. So we can turn them over faster. They look great. We added the tricolor paint because um, we found that we could charge an extra $100 a month just by painting the ceilings white and painting the trim white. Hmm. It's pretty nice. So cost effective yep. and time efficient. That's right. Exactly. Cool. So, you know, the, again, our renovations are geared towards number one, making sure that the property looks great. Number two, making sure it performs as anticipated. And number three, looking good so that it, we can maximize the rents. And that's something we do in the bathrooms as well with these accent tiles and the stainless steel it. appliances cost us $400 extra as opposed to white appliances. We get more rent for it. We've got a stainless steel backsplash in the kitchen, wears really well, it's easy to install. These are all wood cabinets. If somebody breaks a door, or better yet, if there's a leak under the sink, mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about swelling up particle board that I got to rip out the whole cabinet now it's destroyed. I can replace a door. I can you know clean up the wetness and it's mm-hmm. done. The idea here is longevity so that anything that doesn't have a 10 year shelf life is getting replaced and looks great. Um, so let's talk about the renovation process because this yeah. is a big part of what we do. And I think it's really where we shine here. Um, the first thing that's going to happen once we once we contract with someone to uh, to buy a property and a client to buy a property, we'll we'll send out one of our project managers. They go out and then they're going to go through and they create a scope of work. It's really a detailed description, room by room, mechanics by mechanics, on what's getting done in the property. They're going to create a draw schedule that's going to coincide with what we're paying the contractor. So, you know, the first draw is uh is paid before the work starts Mm -hmm. then as we reach completion points the money is dispersed and then we disperse it to the contractor um the construction process and and it really is a process it starts by getting out the old stuff putting in the mechanicals closing up the walls then we we make it pretty so what ends up happening is if we have an eight or ten week project which is pretty typical during that process the house might look terrible for eight weeks and then two weeks, everything comes together, but it's something that just 
happens over time. It's following that process so we don't have to reopen walls. We don't have to go back and try to replace plumbing after the, the drywalls up and tiles right. down. Getting the foundation down. First. That's exactly <laughs> right. Exactly. Once we go through, um, once we start the construction process, we our project managers visit every active site every single day. They take a, like they document the visit, the time of the visit, notes about what's going on, and then uh, take pictures throughout the, the house and all over the place. What we do then is every week, our clients get an update so they know exactly what's going on. So we'll give, cool. you, give them a list of, here's what happened this week. Yeah. Here's what's planned for next week and check out the pictures. And then once we get finished with the project, we're, um, we're creating a, or providing a warranty on the work so that all of this stuff, you know, is, is broken down, but we're, we're creating a warranty for the work so that if there's any maintenance during the first year, we call it our one year zero maintenance warranty. Everything, any, any maintenance items on the house, we take care of them. That's awesome. Yeah. And most of the time it's incidental stuff. Just once a tenant moves in, they're getting settled. There may be an item or two, but yeah. after the first month, there's not many maintenance calls. Yeah. So you said it takes about eight to 10 weeks from start to finish? Eight to 10 weeks for our uh, traditional rentals. Okay. Um, they can extend till 12, depending on the scope of work. It's going to vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now on the, um, on the developing markets model, our renovations are a little more comprehensive. We're ripping down walls. We're ripping out all the framing, taking it. it down to the brick. And then we're creating a retail ready product. So hardwood floors, granite countertops, upgraded appliances with dishwashers, mm -hmm. central air, finished basements, that kind of thing. But it's, I mean, it's a, a very similar product, but it's a little bit higher end. Um, you know, that, that's it for, with, with the area in mind. Yeah. So what happens, you know, cause things can happen in construction. So what if, what happens if, you know, a project takes longer than expected? What so, can the investor expect? Absolutely. So here's, as I said, this is where we shine. These weekly updates are vital. I'll give you a perfect example. We finished up a project last week where we had to replace two contractors throughout the process. The first one, um, I think he bit off more than he could chew. He was mm -hmm. involved in a couple other projects and he just stopped showing up. Um, the second one, we had a, uh, <laughs> we got into a conflict over a draw distribution. So th this is one thing that, um, uh, you know, is we've got a really hard line on. If the draw schedule says that we, um, you know, that there's money due when cabinets are on the walls and the walls are painted. Well, if the ceilings aren't painted, it's not done. The painting is not complete. So yeah. if we're not complete, we're not going to distribute money. Anyway, l long story short, <laughs> throughout the process, the owner of the property knew exactly what was going on, knew what our steps are. Because he gets are. the updates. Okay. Not just that, we were, we were in communication. So we send the updates out, but then obviously there's going to be questions. Right, hey, right. I don't know, you know, what's going on with that window? Or, hey, um, you know, I, I see the heating system's not installed. I thought it'd be installed by now. Or, hey, everything looks great. Keep it up. You know, whatever yeah. <laughs> it is. But there's going to be feedback and, and it's something that we integrate into our process. And sometimes, you know, people want a little bit more um, communication. Sometimes, I mean, we have clients that they read the updates every week. I know because we track it, but I haven't heard from them you know, since we, since we started the yeah. project and it, it is what it is. The, the point is the second contractor that we fired, mm -hmm. the owner knew about it before I, or before the contractor, we discussed it. We had a, so a game plan. We already had another contractor to step in and finish the project, but the open communication, I mean, the whole idea here is that the, we're partnering with the homeowner through the process. Right. If there's an issue, we're on their side. You know, it's not like we're trying to, um, to hide it, something or or to make something look like it's hap is happening that's better than it is it's it is what it is right. you know um the other uh, the other item that a lot of people bring up is like you know how do we know what the costs are going to be so we have um when we send a property out to one of our clients we're putting in a pro forma together it's based on the acquisition construction cash flow projections all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and we'll get into that in a minute but we're guaranteeing the renovation number Within the four walls of the house, we're guaranteeing this is what the cost is going to be. Um, if it costs us $5,000 more, it doesn't cost them anything more. And oh. So we're guaranteeing the cost. The only caveat to that is that outside of the four walls, mainly the front drain line, mm -hmm. probably one in 50 times, 
we've got a problem with it. Um, in that case, it can cost anywhere from eight hundred dollars to six thousand dollars. But beyond that, you know, we've got it's cover. something we can't we handle. Yeah. Cool. So let's uh, you know, it's nice to have a nice property in a nice area, but if you're not making money. Doesn't really help. Oh, I got nope. ahead of myself. I wanted to show you. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show is that the scope of work and the draw schedule. Okay. So these are some snippets. You can see here, you know, this is broken down rear bedroom, middle bedroom, bathroom, everything that's happening in each room. And we go to mechanicals and we've got the exterior front, the rear mm -hmm. exterior, and the overall. It's just broken down by each room of the house, each area, the front of the house, the, the um, you know, any mechanicals that are being done. So there's a clear picture of what's expected. Right. In addition to this, we use a, um, um, a, a template. It's essentially a finish list for each property. These are the type of cabinets we use. This is where to get them. This is the flooring we use. This is where to get them. This is the paint, color, skew, all that stuff. So that goes along with this. So you know exactly what finishes you're going to have. In addition to that, at the bottom of the, um, the scope of work, there's this draw schedule. You can see in this project, it was 42,500 time frame, 60 days. Mm -hmm. And then it's broken down upon settlement, 10,000 is due. Upon completion of the demolition, clean out roof, 10,000. And it goes through the project. So just everything's like laid that. out pretty clearly. That's exactly right. Um, the daily oversight, this happens, we use a, a software called Basecamp. These are project photos, you know, and you can see here, all right, there's no work done at the property today. John, who's the GC woke up and you can see, okay, he mm -hmm. went to the property at 7.30 in the morning. The GC didn't show up. Why the heck isn't he at the job site? And he follows up and he's taking pictures and documenting. The next day he'll list, okay, this is what happened there. If there's, you can see here, if there's any issues to address with the contractor, we're documenting them and then, and then following up to make sure that they're addressed. If there's anything that we need to address with the owner, it's in here so yeah. that we can communicate. I can communicate with the project manager No, and know what's happening on site without having to physically stand there and watch a contractor work. Right, right. This is really cool because, you know, this means that the investor doesn't really have to be in the Philadelphia area. They exactly. could be out of state or even out of the country and they'll know exactly what's going on. Well, and this is this is why we put this together. My right. first client was from Israel, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's like this. We want full transparency without, um, you know, without having to sit there and watch the work, yeah. right? And so... We, we log all this stuff and then our, the weekly updates. I mean, this is a, a clip from a weekly update. You can see this is what happened last week. This is what's scheduled for the next week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, based on the progress, looks like Friday, blah, 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 blah. Final punch list is likely. And then, um, you know, just notes here on what's going on. You click on the link here and you're viewing pictures of the project as cool. it goes along. So, I mean, that's the construction side. I'm pretty, pretty, uh, proud of what we put together in the communication end. So on the, on the calculations, this is our final um, foundational point. The calculations are the most important part because let's face it, you know. That's how you make money. It's yeah. exactly, <laughs> the, this, the whole idea is to, to make money. So we have two evaluations that we do on every property. The first one is based on recent comparable sales. Mm -hmm. For every property, we want, the, um, we want our clients to see about 20,000 in equity or more. Okay. To, um, you know, we've got to make our fee, right? right? We're looking at the comparable sales and saying, okay, this place has granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, a dishwasher, and for central air. Our place doesn't have that. So we have to make sure that we're projecting an exit appraisal value that isn't the highest appraised, you know, the highest sale in the area, but it's comparable to what we're producing. So, you know, we'll, we'll usually discount the, um, the ARV by maybe $20,000 or the after pair value by $20,000. And then we take off the equity and then we build an R fee and we build in the construction. And that's how we come up with our number. Okay. If there's enough spread at that point, then what we do is we look at the cash flow model. Okay. So one of my least favorite, I don't think I ever told you this, Elise. This is one of my least favorite terms in real estate and that is a cap rate. Oh. And the reason for the cap rate the reason I don't like the cap rate is it, it allows people to hide a lot of things. I don't want to hide anything. And so we, at, with every property, we put together a cash flow, cash flow pro forma, just like this one. Okay. And this, this is a, a, an actual property that we sold to an investor. Um, we anticipated that the after repair value or the appraisal value would be 115,000. Uh -huh. Paid 60,000 for the house. Okay. 
We got our closing costs right in here. We're just under 3,000. That included a builder, builder's risk insurance policy, transfer taxes, insurance. Um, title insurance, and then uh, miscellaneous title fees. And then we spent 40,000 on the rehab. His total investment was just under 103,000, anticipated $1,200 a month rent, vacancy rate, are adjusted and he didn't have any financing right or is there's no financing, financing in okay. this there's no financing in a capitalization rate okay it's only like a cash on cash straight up cash on cash return now when we're looking at expenses this is usually where people hide numbers right mm. so with every property in the city of philadelphia there's a 50 dollars annual license fee that's the first thing Next, you've got property insurance and taxes. This is usually the only thing that people will use in their, in their cap rate. But there's a leasing fee. Each one, of our, um, each one of our single family residents stay for an average of two years. So we anticipate paying a leasing fee to lease the property every two years. Right, so right. we annualize that to a half a month's rent. Likewise, we look at the management fee, 7% of collected rents. There it is. And beyond that, yeah, you know what? We're going to give you a one-year maintenance warranty. But guess what? At some point, whether it's year two or year 10, there's going to be maintenance right, on the property. So it's going to happen. And if there's nothing in year one through nine, you're probably going to have that you know, $7,000 or $6,900 in expenses after a 10-year period. right? So at some point, you're going to spend it. We deduct all this from the income. It ends up with just over $10,000 a year divided by 103000 gives us a cap rate just below 10%, okay? So yes, I could make this look like it was 15%. All we have to do is get rid of the maintenance and repairs, the management and the leasing. All of a sudden you're making 20% on your money. Mm -hmm. But in reality, you know, I wanna give you a realistic expectation of what your income is gonna be from this property year after year after year. So now let's pretend we refi it. Okay. okay? So a lot of our clients buy in cash, fund the renovation, once the tenant's in place, they'll refinance the property. This is that exact same property with a 30-year adjustable rate mortgage mm -hmm. at 6% interest, 80% of the appraised value on the refi. So we've got the same numbers, same, inco um, same income numbers, rental, all that stuff. Same expenses, except we're adding a principal and interest payment here, annually of just under 6,700. Changes our cash flow from that 10,000 number to um, just under $300 a month, and it's mm -hmm. gonna be like 290 some dollars a month. But our only investment here is $11,000. So now the leverage return here is closer to 30, you know, it's more than 30%, 32.5%. This is what happens a lot in our traditional rental area. The upside on these properties, the areas continue to stabilize and get better, but the upside here is that you're gonna be able to pay off this house, you'll, you'll get your entire investment back in three years. Uh -huh. Then everything above and beyond that is gravy. Plus, you've got you know $2,100 almost, $2,000 put aside for any maintenance on the property. Um, plus, you build in a leasing fee, which you you know you haven't paid, and it, it's there's a lot of benefits on this side. Okay, now on the on the developing markets neighborhoods, this is a little bit different. The numbers work a little bit differently. In that, in this case, this is um, 2800 block of Tulip Street. This is that property that we just talked about in Port Richmond. Oh, okay. So this house, I said 55. I guess it was 60. We sold this to the investor for 60,000. Put 75 into it, much bigger renovation mm -hmm. budget. We anticipated 155,000 on the exit. The actual appraisal value uh, was 185. Ooh. Yeah, which is awesome, right? Uh, rental rate, this is a two bedroom, it's a smaller house, higher okay. value, um, 1,200 a month. So, you know, you, you go through the same multipliers and, and bottom line is 7.38% uh, cap rate, not a huge cash flow return but you're making money quick question yeah so for people who are new to investing what is a good cap rate like what should people aim for so that's a really hard question to answer of course <laughs> right um so it depends on the goal there are people right. i mean the, you, you read about these um these apartments that sell for like a hundred million dollars in mm -hmm. new york right most of that money is coming from overseas from places where 
people need to have a secure place to put their money, right? They're in an environment where the banking is not as secure. They might be dealing with a government that may or may not, um, you know, maybe not, maybe may or may not take their money out of their right. account. So they want to put it somewhere secure. In that case, like the cap rate zero or negative, right? But on something where, you know, on, on, let's say just a really solid A class neighborhood where, um, you know, where you might live or where you or I might live, mm -hmm. that neighborhood, um, you're, you're probably going to have zero, uh, cap rate. If you can get 5%, it's fantastic. Okay. Most of the people that are renting in those areas, they bought years ago and they're making money because they bought, you know, 30 years ago when the price was a hundred grand as mm -hmm. opposed to a million now. Um, depending on the quality of the neighborhood, it's going to be anywhere from, let's say 5% in a really nice neighborhood mm -hmm. up to 15%, maybe even 20% in a, in a neighborhood that's like D or F class where it's like, you know, really inexpensive to get in. Um, but you know, the chances of you getting a, a um, <laughs> collecting the rent is like 50, 50 each month. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, you've got a trade off there. Right. Typically, the higher the cap rate, the more headaches you're going to have. Mm, and so we try to balance that by selecting these areas where we have good tenants, where we know we can get, um, you know, people in that can afford to pay the rent. That's the best case scenario. Okay. Um, so in this this case, we've got our developing markets neighborhood with financing. This is the same property. Um, we've added in the uh, principal and interest. And you can see here, in this case, the investor has 14000 in the house. Not that much money in there. But they're only making a hundred dollars a month, less than a hundred bucks a month. That's after all expenses, but mm -hmm. still, it's only about an eight percent, eight percent cap rate. Not eight percent cap rate. I'm sorry, cash on cash return. Okay. So you know, once once we've evaluated a property, we've gone through, we looked at the, the comparable sales, we go through the cash flow here. Um, you know, once we've gotten to the point where we know, all right, this is a property we're going to go after. We'll lock it down, we put it under contract, and then we send it out to a specific investor because that, that kind of goes to our next next slide here. And this is the last one. We're almost done uh, with the webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. But, um, so listen, here, here's where this whole thing starts. So if you are somebody that you've been interested in getting into real estate, haven't really know where, uh, known where to start, or you've gone through, um, maybe you've done some deals before, but you just, you know what, how much time and effort and energy goes into it. Um, our next step, if you're interested in getting more information, it's a needs analysis call. And what we do during this is we'll talk about your goals, your ambitions, why you were looking in, at real estate and what you'd like to accomplish from the investment. And from there, if you if you say, all right, let's move forward, Josh, what we would do is we you, you essentially place an order with us. We go out and we find that property. You know, we analyze it, we go through the construction, we make sure that it's in a neighborhood that we're looking for and that, that the returns are gonna be good and that it meets the needs of the, the investor that we are looking at it for. We put it under contract. We'll put together a, a whole pro forma, pictures, video walkthrough, mm -hmm. comparable sales, a description of the project, uh, a cash flow analysis, and we send it over to the investor. We say, hey, look, it, uh, let's pretend it's you, Elise, right? Elise, take a look at this, um, uh, this property. Tell me what you think. And sometimes, about 50% of the time, we hit the nail on the head the first try, mm -hmm. you know, and it's perfect. Everything looks good. We move forward with it. The other half of the time, we screwed up somewhere. <laughs> you know, maybe I missed it's one of your perfect. signals. Yeah. Right. Maybe you want more cash flow. Maybe you're looking for more equity. Maybe you're looking in a developing market, or maybe you're looking for a duplex or a triplex instead of a single family. Whatever it is, you give me the feedback. And guess what? We go out and find a deal. Once we find something that fits your needs, um, you well, I'll send you a contract. You sign it, send it back to me. There's a deposit that goes in escrow with the title company. It's five thousand dollars on the property. Um, and then there's about 10 to 15 days before, from the time we have a contract to the time we go to settlement. During that time, a couple things are going to happen. First, we're going to um, get your insurance set up. We have a, um, a group rate here at TCS where we're able to get a really big discount on the um, builder's risk insurance and on landlord insurance. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Um, so we get that set up. That's great, yeah. We set up the utility transfers and we put together a... Um, a scope of work very much like the one we went over it'll mm -hmm. have a breakdown of every every room of the house the mechanicals all that stuff and then we'll have a um a what a scope or a, excuse me a draw schedule at the end 
about two or three days before settlement, we'll send you out the closing documents with wiring instructions. Now, 90% of our clients never show, show up to settlement. If they want to come to settlement, we'll schedule it in our office. I would love to have you here. But most of our clients, they just sign everything overnight back to the title company and schedule a wire to fund the, uh, the, the purchase. From there, we go through settlement. Within a week, you'll have all of your documents, paper copies. Within 24 hours of settlement, you'll have an electronic copy of the deed, mm -hmm. of the signed settlement sheet, and of the marked up title. Um, and then within about two weeks, you have all the insurance policies, all that kind of stuff. But within seven days of, um, of the purchase, we start renovations on the property. So we'll jump right into it. And then within just a few weeks, you got a rent ready property that's appraising for great money. So, you know, once that happens, we turn it over to leasing, they lease the property and then TCS management manages it. Uh, we're all here on the same floor at 107 South 2nd street. Um, we are really intimately involved with them and, um, you know, it's a really great relationship. So, I mean, at least, do you have any questions for me? I think we kind of covered everything that I wanted to, to ask you. Awesome. So, recap, high level. We find properties for the investor. Yep. We renovate it. They're in the know. They get constant updates from us. Um, and then we basically rent it out and the investor just kind of chills. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and really we've, we've done everything that we can to take out the hands-on part of it. Yeah. The um, stressful parts. It, exactly. I mean, we've got, <laughs> our, our management company uses a departmental model. We've got one person, um, actually we have a whole department that their whole job is to interact with tenants. So if somebody calls, they email, they've got a problem, they've got somebody to talk to them. That keeps tenants there longer. Yeah. We have a, an entire division that's responsible for the, the renovations and maintenance. We've got an entire division that leases properties. I mean, we lease somewhere between 60 and 85 units a month. Wow. Um, you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's a comprehensive overview. And then we have a portfolio manager that their whole job is to interact with our clients and make sure that they're up to date. And at the end of the day, you know, we become the, the touch point for all of our clients working through this process. So it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we handle everything from, you know, sourcing, once we know what our investors want, yeah. sourcing the properties, renovation, um, constant updates, insurance, um, you know, any permitting or any, any of the, um, anything that goes along on that side. And we just take it from start to finish. So this can be truly a hands-free uh, real estate investment. Yeah, this sounds awesome. So listen, if you're here on the webinar today and you're thinking, you know what, I'd be interested in getting a little bit more information, now's the time to do it, right? So below this video, all you have to do is click on the button. You can schedule a needs analysis call with myself uh, and or Elise <laughs> um, sitting here and just kind of go over exactly what you're looking for. If you just want to ask some questions, it's things that we didn't cover here on the webinar. It's a great time to do it. Um, but once we get an idea of what you're looking to accomplish and you get your questions answered, we can get the ball rolling and get you a property, um, you know, that is very exclusive for you in uh, just a pretty short period of time. So like I said, click on the link um, right below the video and uh, I can't wait to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, okay, great. Until we talk again, we want to wish you the best of luck in your real estate investing and have a fantastic day. See you guys.